We are wrapping up this morning as kids are leaving, turn to Isaiah. We are actually wrapping up the first major section, the longest section, um, chapters 1 through 39. We'll end today looking at two chapters, 38 and 39. Uh, so we're wrapping up the first section. We're going to take another break, which we'll do in these longer books, take breaks along the way. Um, and we will be back into it after the holidays. But meanwhile, as we finish up, wrap up today, next week begins Advent, I know. Can you believe it? Christmas is here. Uh, we begin our new series, Advent, uh, Christ in the Carols, a biblical look at five songs that we love to sing um, and uh, see their rich and theological truths, how they came to be by the Word of God. Uh, and these uh, songs really just rich in, in, in theological meaning. And we, as we celebrate the birth of the first Advent, the coming of Christ, uh, we hope that that study together would be, um, you know, just enrich us as we grow in the knowledge and love of Jesus. So invite your friends if they've never been to Advent. We'll have readings, we'll have candles, and we'll have a series, Christ in the Carol. So turn with me, though, to Isaiah chapter 38 and 39. That is our scripture lesson this morning, chapters 38 and 39. Now, as we get into this chapter, I think it's important that you recognize that although chapter 38 comes after 37, 38 is bigger than 37, I learned that even in public school, um, it's not chronological. And that's important to understand. Isaiah puts this story about King Hezekiah's sickness and his healing and selfishness at the end of this major section, as I said, chapter 39. But it occurred at some point before the Assyrian conflict that we've been talking about over the past few weeks. Okay, and we'll explain why. Some commentators actually date this sickness and healing um, and the Babylon, we'll see the Babylonian um, visit 10 years before the Assyrian was on the doorsteps of Jerusalem. Something 10 years, not, I, I lean more towards other commentators that think maybe, maybe a year or two. That's where I kind of lean. It's right before uh, what we've been talking about before the siege of Jerusalem. Um, it's hard to know exactly when this took place, but if you have your Bibles open, if you look at chapter 38, verse 6, we know that this, this text, this narrative happened before the Assyrian, um, uh, what we've been talking about, the Assyrian conflict, because it says to Isaiah, chapter 38, verse 6, uh, I will deliver you and the city out of the hand of the king of Assyria and will defend the city. So we know what happened to happen before that. We ended last week with that exactly what took place. So this is sometime before that. And you say, well, he already told Hezekiah that. Why do we see it again? Because if you're anything like me, I need to be told not twice, but four times, five times. That's why when we go to a scripture lesson, as I've been taught in Bible school, chapters, whatever, and verse, say it about five times. Some people get it after the third, but you just keep repeating it because we need, that's just who we are, right? No surprise. But anyway, just really quickly, 10 tribes of Israel to the north, the Assyrian nation destroys them in 721 B.C. They march down into, Jeru into Israel, uh, takes over Samaria, which is their city. God in his sovereignty is chastising his people for their covenant-breaking sin. And God does not stop there, and he marches down into Jerusalem, what we've been looking at. Remember, God loves his people, and God loves you, and God loves me. And God's not going to allow us to continue in our sin without disciplining them. It's a mark of his love. And although King Hezekiah, who's in Judah and uh, Jerusalem, although King Hezekiah is somewhat a reformer, uh, it really didn't take root or it wasn't deep enough or wide enough and had a lasting impact. In fact, we know, as we've been talking about, Hezekiah, like his father Ahaz, ran to foreign nations for refuge, protection, and shelter rather than running to his God. Ahaz, we know, made an alliance with Assyria, and now we know, as we've been learning, King Hezekiah ran down to Egypt to get help, and then we'll see today, actually, Babylon as well. So over the past couple of weeks, we've been seeing, we've been, we've been witnessing the narrative that Sennacherib, who is the king of Assyria, along with his army, his trusted emissary called Rapshika, probably one of the close comrades of the king, has been threatening and intimidating Judah. And they've been mocking Judah and mocking God. Not a good combo. You don't want to mock God's people and then turn around and, and mock God himself. 
And at some point, though, during this mocking we've seen over the past couple of weeks, Hezekiah humbles himself. Uh, he's broken, he humbles himself, and he seeks the Lord in repentance, and he prays, and he asks God for, for help. And God comes to Hezekiah through the prophet, through his man Isaiah, and promises him comfort and deliverance. God responds to his people, even though they're sinners and they deserve wrath. He gives them mercy and grace and comfort. That's why we call it the gospel according to Isaiah. Is because God in his grace to sinners like you and I comes and gives us grace and mercy through the cross, through the work of Jesus. God tells Hezekiah, I heard your prayer. And he judges, we saw this last week, the Assyrian nation. And he, and he promises to deliver Judah and he judged the Assyrian nation. And that's exactly what he does. Last week we ended with God's wrath being poured out on the Assyrians somewhere in Judah. And 185,000, remember, an angel of the Lord came upon the camp, and 185,000 men in one night were dead in the Assyrian camp. And then Sennacherib, the king, is sent home in defeat. And then we read as he was murdered by his sons by the sword. Exactly what God said was going to happen, no shock. Our narrative, our narrative this morning is a story that takes place Sometime a little bit earlier than what we've seen over the past couple of weeks. At some point before the Assyrian nation is on the doorstep of Jerusalem, Hezekiah gets sick. And he prays for healing. And God heals him. Just as he prayed for deliverance and God did, delivered him, he prays for healing. But the problem we'll see today is that Hezekiah hears the word of the Lord, gets the healing from God, even sings about it. But it doesn't spark growth in his faith. Unfortunately, the story actually ends with Hezekiah being self-absorbed rather shamelessly. Shamelessly. So jump into our text where we can learn three things as we look at the sickness and selfishness. Three things. One is we'll look at the sickness and the healing of Hezekiah. Second, we'll look at the song or the psalm of lament and praise. And finally, the selfish, as we get to chapter 39, response to discipline and exile. Sickness to song and the selfishness, okay? So that's where we're at. Turn chapter 38. Let me read to you the first eight verses. Hear the word of the Lord. Chapter 38, Isaiah, verses 1 through 8. Chapter 38, <laughs> verses 1 through 8. Hear the word of the Lord. In those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and, and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die. You will not recover. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Please, O Lord, remember how I walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I heard your prayers. I've seen your tears. Behold, I'll add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria and will defend this city. This shall be a sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he promised. Behold, verse 8, I will make the shadow cast by the declining sun on the dial of Ahaz turn back 10 steps. So the sun turned back on the dial of the 10th step by which it had declined. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Now, we don't know what exactly happened with Hezekiah, his sickness. Look down with me at verse 21, and you'll see that one of the symptoms, now verse 21, now as I had said, let them take a, fig, a cake of figs and apply it to the boil that he may recover. So something happened, whether it's internal, external, there was a boil, which, which would make him unclean to worship at the temple. So we don't know exactly what that was, but there was, there was a boil. It was something that needed to be done. And, and at any rate, we know that the king's life, whatever was going on, was ebbing away. And Isaiah the prophet uh, of God comes to him uh, with, you know, news. Not, probably not news he wanted to hear. Here comes the prophet. I hope he got some good news. No. Get your house in order. You're going to die. You're like, wow, you're a bearer of good news. You got any other message for me, you know? I mean, dying's not something you want to talk about. I don't know about you. I've been in a situation uh, where I've had to talk about it. It's, it's, it's hard. It's a difficult conversation. It's not easy. It's not comfortable at all. But it's a reality. In fact, the scripture speaks about it 
as a reality. Doesn't try to run from it, doesn't try to escape from it, doesn't say, you know, suck it up, stoic idea of just handle it. It faces it dead on. And there are those who debate, I read this this week, that Hezekiah should have just heard the word of the Lord, listen, you're going to die, and just said, okay, and accepted God's word and not pray for healing. I guess they never were told that information. Because I don't know about you, but I'd be praying. Right? And there's too much ink was spilled on that verse as far as I'm concerned. I'm like, are they really debating this? Put yourself in his shoes. He's praying. Maybe you're not getting better and you're not getting healed. And you're like, Lord, come take me because I know it's better to be with you. I get that. But, Lord, if I could be restored, I'm praying. So if God were to say to you, put your house in order, what would it look like? I can tell you one thing confidently, because the Bible talks about it. 1 Corinthians 15 is a good place. First thing you must do to put your house in order is to get right with God. Just get right with God. Are you here this morning? Are you confident that Jesus Christ died as your sacrifice, your substitute? His death atoned for your sin and to give you life? Is the perfect life of Christ the life you could not live? Has it been imputed to you, counted to you by faith in Christ alone, by faith alone? Therefore, you have peace with God. Your house is in order, Romans 5.1. We've been justified, we've been made right with God by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's most important. Let me tell you, no matter how much financial planning, if look, put your house in order, get your finances in order, I get that. No matter how many sorrowful goodbyes that would take, put yourself in that shoe, in those shoes. Nothing compares to putting your house in order by repenting of your sin and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing. That's eternal. That's eternal. Trusting Christ. So Hezekiah prays, verses 2 and 3. And honestly, it's a rather bold prayer. And I, I read that prayer several times this week, and I'm thinking, that would not be my prayer. Lord, remember, I'm sick. I'm dying. Remember how I walk with you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and then what is good in your sight. With all due respect, I'd be like, remember how I tried to walk, and I really didn't do such a great job. <laughs> I'd rather you remember your faithfulness than my faithfulness. That would be my prayer. Hezekiah is a man of mixed, uh, a mixed bag. He has faith, and sometimes he doesn't. Second Kings says he was a faithful king. Yet Second Chronicles says he was proud and did not respond to the kindness of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord's wrath was upon him. And you may say, well, hold on. Is it, is it he's faithful or is he proud? It's a contradiction. No, and if you live with me, you don't. It's not a contradiction. It's like both. I get that, right? Hezekiah's a good king. He knows he blew it. He's appealing on, his, on the stuff he did well. Yeah, he's just coming to the Lord. And as he prays this prayer, if you see, all of a sudden at the end of verse 3, he just weeps bitterly, you know, trying to put myself in his shoes. Is he, is he just overcome with, with emotions, with the news Maybe he realized that after everything he said about trusting God, he's like, yeah, that's not really going to help me much. I don't know. I don't know. We learn in 2 Kings chapter 21 something very important. Hezekiah is a young man. Hezekiah has no heir to the throne at this place, at this point. Maybe he's learning that, you know what, if I go, I got nobody to take the throne. That was devastating in that day. No, no, no seed of David, no, no lineage to, to press on. Manasseh is going to be born during those 15 years he lives. Even though Manasseh is like the worst king they ever had, still a successor to the king. You know, sometimes we suffer uh, illnesses and life-threatening illnesses. Uh, good works are not going to get us there, right? All we do is cry out for mercy, confess our sins, and trust the Lord. And sometimes God chooses to miraculously heal the sick. There's no doubt about it. If it fits in his purposes, his greater purposes, we're, we're called to pray. James chapter 5 says, call the elders if you're sick. Not the elders, call you. Just telling you, just, just saying. There, there have been, I can't even count, maybe hundreds, I don't know. I've been here almost 17 years. That we have been in my office, gathered the elders around people, and prayed. We do it all the time. You're sick, call the elders. We'll have you, we'll pray over you. And we've seen God work miraculously. Not all the time. 
We trust him. There's a false teaching out there. I'll just throw this out there. Take a little bunny trail. That says that Christ's atonement on the cross guarantees physical healing. Sometimes I look on a website. If somebody's looking for a church that maybe left to another community, I'll look for them. That's one of the things I look for. Because if it says that, I tell them don't go. I tell them don't go. That's, that's the health and wealth prosperity gospel nonsense. Not only is it untrue, unbiblical, but very, very dangerous. In fact, Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, When Adam sinned, suffering and death entered into the world. 1 Corinthians 15 just says, uh, In Adam all die, so also in Christ all are made alive. And Jesus Christ is the second Adam. By his wounds and his death, burial, and resurrection, we will be healed. In the end, we will be with him forever. But by God's providence, what God is going to, what, 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 what's the last enemy that's going to be put under Christ's feet is death. And therefore, we all face it. And it's amazing to me that people talk about the atonement as a guarantee of, of healing, and then they die. I'm like, all right. So you weren't healed. Oh, well, you know, you die of other things. Well, you're still dead. <laughs> I don't understand it. All right. That's a little bunny trail, but I just don't get it. Anyway. But God does heal, and God, we should pray, and we should ask. And he does heal him. Hezekiah prays like he did in 37, a very different prayer in chapter 37 we saw last week. But he gets the affirmative, yes, you will be healed. Isaiah chapter 38, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer, seen your tears, I'm ahead in 15 years. I'm going to deliver you too from the king's hand of Assyria, and I will defend this city. Now, whenever you see this, whenever you see God respond, I am the God of David, your father, immediately you should think 2 Samuel 7. Just saying, right? If the promise that God gave to David, that someone will sit on his throne, uh, he'll have, a, he'll have a, a, a king coming from David, from the, from the seed of David, from the, from the lineage of David, who will sit on upon an eternal throne, and that offspring must come to usher in not only the eternal throne, but an everlasting kingdom. We saw that in Isaiah already, and we know who that one is. His name is Jesus Christ. And notice, though, how Isaiah does not, when Isaiah turns around and tells Hezekiah what God says, he doesn't say, oh, God heard your prayers, and he agrees with you. You're such a good guy. You've done so much. You've been so faithful. He doesn't say any of that. What does he say? I saw your prayer. I heard your prayer. I saw your tears. In other words, it's grace. <laughs> it's all of grace. And God does in grace act this way at times. Giving us what we don't deserve. Not because it's according to our deeds. But according of his mercy and grace. God says, you got 15 years. 15 more years. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd be like, all right, 15 years, 15 years. What date is that? You know what I mean? But 15 years. It's like, Lord, is it of the day? Is it the year? The beginning? I don't know. But you have 15 years to live. And then he promises to deliver him from the attack. Now, if you notice the prayer, he doesn't mention that. Lord, heal me. Give me 15 more years. Maybe, you know, doesn't say, Lord, give me 20. And the Lord's like, ah, 15. You know, we don't see any of that. He just says, hey, I'm crying out to you. And God in his grace giving us more than we the ability to ask or imagine, Ephesians chapter 3, and grants this to him. It's amazing how God eternal purposes doesn't change. But as I mentioned once before, we're 100% predictable. This man is sick. And in his sickness, he turns 100%. To the Lord. He just, he just turns around and, and he cries out to God. And in verse 7, he says, Behold, I will make, I'll give you a sign. I'll make uh, the shadow cast by the declining sun of the dial of Hayaz turn back 10 steps. There's a lot of ink on this, too. Sundial, staircase, maybe a, a staircase that acted like a sundial. I, I don't, we don't really know. Ahaz probably had some steps. And from the, from the window, you could see as the sun was coming up, the, 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 uh, the shadow would come up the steps, and you could tell what time it was. I mean, you could see that just from anyone, any, any place in that sense. So we don't know. But one thing we do know from 2 Kings, 2 Kings 20 says that Hezekiah was told by Isaiah. Isaiah said to Hezekiah, listen, do you want the sun to go up or do you want the sun to go down? You Pick the sign. If you remember, Ahaz was given, his father was said, hey, we're going to give you a sign. He said, oh, no, 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 I don't want no sign. He was being disobedient. 
Hezekiah is told by Isaiah, listen, you want the sun to go up or go down? And now Hezekiah is like, all right, going up is not a big deal. It goes up every day. Let the sun go backwards. Let, this, let, the, let the shadow recline. Pretty amazing. Either God stopped the normal movement of the sun in the solar system, which he can. He created it or he did something miraculous in Jerusalem that day. Ray Ortland says, a miracle is a persuasive as a sign from God precisely because we can't explain it. It's not human. It must be of God. That's the point. Apparently, in this case, God temporarily bent the sunlight. And why not? He created it. He controls it. He do whatever he wants. And the shadow went backwards, at least enough for a sign. That's the point. He said, that's the point. That's what happened. And, and, and as you read this, maybe, maybe you come from whatever background you come from. You think, okay, I'm going to go home. I'm going to be like, all right, Lord, do I take this job? Stop the sun. Like, don't go home and do that. Don't go home and do that. Um, yes, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But God has been revealing himself through the Old Testament. And now he has to complete his revelation. We know in chapter, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, in Christ. He is the final word. Right? In fact, in Matthew 12, Jesus takes the religious leaders, talks to religious leaders, and they're asking for a sign. You know, we don't know what sign. Well, maybe, it, you know, give us a sign. And Jesus turns to that and says, turns to them and says, this is an evil and adulterous generation, for they seek a sign. But no sign will be given to them except what? The sign of the prophet Jonah. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days, three nights in the heart of the earth. Folks, you want to sign if you want a sign of the faithfulness of God, the love of God, the care of God, the promises of God, just look inside the empty tomb. That's your sign. Look inside the empty tomb. The sickness and healing of Hezekiah. Now, let's look at verse 10, the song. Now, let me, let me read it to you first. Verse, verse uh, 9. A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after he had been sick and had recovered from his sickness. So that kind of sets the stage. I said in the middle of my days I must depart. I'm consigned to the gates of Sheol for the rest of my years. I said I shall not see the Lord, the Lord in the land of the living. I shall look on man no more among the inhabitants of the world. My dwelling is plucked up and, my, and removed from me like a shepherd's tent, like a weaver. I have rolled up my life. He cuts me off from my loom, from the loom. From day to night you bring me to an end. I calm myself until morning. Like a lion he breaks all my bones. From day to night you bring me to the end. Like a swallow or a crane I chirp. I moan like a dove. My eyes are weary with looking upward. O oh Lord, I am oppressed. Be my pledge of safety. Those first 14 verses is talking about a sickness. Now verse 15, he's talking about his healing. What shall I say? For he has spoken to me. And he himself has done it. I have walked slowly all my years because of the bitterness of my soul. O oh Lord, by these things men live. And in all these things in the life of my spirit. O oh, restore me to health. Make me live. Behold, it was for my welfare that I had great bitterness. But in love, but in love, you have delivered my life from the pit of destruction. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. For Sheol does not thank you. Death does not praise you. Those who go down to the pit do not have hope for your faithfulness. No hope for your faithfulness. Verse 19. The living, the living, he thanks you as I do this day. The Father makes known to the children your faithfulness. The Lord will save me. And we will play my music on stringed instruments all the days of our lives. at The house of the Lord. Again, 10 through 14. Describing his sickness, his condition, verses 15 to 20, he praises him for the mercy that's been shown to him. And you know, overall, you could just see this, this, this human helplessness of Hezekiah. I, I, I'm, I'm done. I, there's nothing I can do. And then you see this faithfulness, this, this divine trustworthiness that even the king, the most powerful person in Jerusalem, is helpless before death. But God can restore. He holds the keys. Now, if we look at the first part of this section, you know that death was upon them. And he says in verse uh, 10 that he's in the middle of my days. Just a, just a cue that is young. He's like, I'm a young man. I don't have any children. I don't have a son anyway to inherit the throne. But I, I'm in the middle of my days. And he senses the sorrow 
as he realizes that death means that his interaction with God in the, in the physical realm here on earth is going to change. And that his interaction with his people and his family, his friends, is going to come to an end. Now, this is not a thesis on, you know, life uh, after death. That's not what he's talking about. He's, he's a man who's going to die at this point. He's looking at death, and he's saying things are going to change when he dies. In verse 12, Hezekiah says, my life is fragile, temporary, like a shepherd's tent, like a weaver who's just rolled up his, 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 his cloth. And, and he says, you know, things come and they go. They roll out, they roll in. We put the tent together, we take it down. It reminds me of James 4. What is your life? For you are a mist, a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And sometimes, especially if you're young, I mean, I, I was young once. <laughs> you know, you're like, I got 4,000 years left, you know. It's like, and all of a sudden you're struck and you're like, yeah, I don't have a lot of time. Remember, he's talking about a sickness at this point. He's talking about a suffering, verse 13, about coming through another night. Hard night until he's calmed in the morning. He says, God who acts like a lion breaks all my bones. You know, God is powerful like a lion with his prey. Overcome. There's nothing I can do. Acknowledgement of the power of God. And the fear that Hezekiah has before the Almighty One. Verse 14, it further explains his pitiful conditions like a, a chattering of birds, a moaning of a dove. In other words, he's saying is I, I can't even pray. I, I can't even, you know, you get that place. I, I, I just, I, I'm just murmuring. I'm just I'm murmuring. I, I, there's not much. I'm weak. I don't know what to say. I'm broken. I'm bitter. I'm hurting. Emotional and physical anguish. I could only groan a few words. Yet, still despite this, look what it says. Even though his suffering came from the Lord, Hezekiah, look what it says, will not cease looking upwards to Adonai, Lord. Ruler, sovereign, reigning king of heaven and earth. I'll look up. I moan like a dove. My eyes are weary with looking upward. Looking upward. Hezekiah knows this condition came to him no matter what through the permission and knowledge of God who has the power to change it, but there's a brokenness here. And he's looking up to, to the extent in which his eyes are weary and family, sometimes our eyes are weary. Sometimes our hearts are weary. Sometimes we are, you know, at that place where we just sound like a chirping bird, but we must, must, must look up. Look up. He says, I am oppressed, be my pledge. I am oppressed, be my pledge, be my safety. Be my safety. Oh, I mean... That word safety, by the way, is a, a, a legal metaphor picturing God as the run in a role of standing near a friend or a family member in a, in a court setting. It's a legal term, uh, providing a, 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 a support, a pledging, a support to someone. And Hezekiah acknowledges, I love this, it, you know, it almost sounds like, well, which one is, I said before, contradiction, but put yourself in his place. My eyes are weary, I am oppressed. I'm, I'm hurting, but I'm going to look to the Lord. I'm going to look to the Lord. He is the one. I'm distressed, I'm troubled, but the same one who is, who is allowing this to happen is the same one who could take my life. He's the same one I am seeking refuge and safety and security in. Where else could you go? Where else would you want to go? Too often we wait. God says, come to me. And he's crying out for help. Verse 15 through 20 is a change of focus. It's a change from, from suffering to healing, from sorrow to salvation, from lamenting to praise. As Hezekiah turns his attention, notice in verse 15, to the word of the Lord. Verse 15, what shall I say? For he has spoken to me, and he himself has done it. God has spoken his word. God keeps his word. And now Hezekiah says he's done it through the spoken word. And the assurance he has now that the Lord has spoken and he's going to restore his life. And he's going to uh, 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 complete that in which he started. Well, that which he said, I should say. His word will be done and performed. And he's healed. But notice with me, even though he says he spoke it, 
and has done it. Look what it says in the next, ver- in the next part of that ver- verse 15. I walk slowly all my years because of the bitterness of my soul. In other words, although I have received that from the Lord, what it has done to me is now I'm going to walk slowly. Okay, that word slowly. I'm, gonna, I'm going to mellow a little bit. I- I'm going to um, have thoughtful movements. I'm going to be less frantic of life because the, what, what has caused this, 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 this disease has caused me to have bitterness of soul. In other words, what I have experienced has had a major impact in my life. Have you had an experience that had a major impact in your life? I'm not talking a month later, I forget. I'm talking a complete, total reversal. I'm a whole different person today. I mean, Christ promises that when we come to faith in him. And some of y'all have been here or here have come to faith in Christ because of a life-changing incident in your life. A life-changing incident in your life. And God used it for his glory and your salvation. I'll walk slowly. Bitterness of my soul. I've learned a valuable lesson. I'll live humbly, more humble, more grateful. I won't forget I won't live proudly and arrogant. It's changed the way I view the Lord and my suffering. And verse 16 even talks about showing it, excuse me, how Hezekiah now through the healing, through the suffering, will, is fit to teach other people. Praying that others will learn from his experience. But jump down to set verse 17 with me. Do I have it up here? Yeah, 17 with me. Very interesting verse. Very interesting verse. It, it, it's the, verse 17 is the place that I wish all of us come to. In our suffering. A place where as we're suffering, as we're, we're hurting, as we're crying out in anguish, I hope all of us come to this place. A place that we all see that, our, that, that the suffering and the hardship and pain that we've gone through is purposeful. We recognize that God is using this experience and recognizing God is going to take that and use it to help us to grow in our faith and our reliance upon him. As they say, I don't want to become bitter, I want to become better. To grow in our trust. It was for my welfare that I had great bitterness. For, for my shalom, for my peace, that I had great bitterness. Calamity comes and suffering comes and God uses it for our peace. Peace with him. Peace with us. Peace with those around us. Paul said we know that those that we, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purposes, Romans 8. Affliction has a way of teaching us and humbling us. And really, I, I don't know about you, but also has a way to say, yes, sir. I, I, Lord, thank you. I love you. I'm hurting. I, wh- wh- what do you want me to do? Like, even more obediently, even more cautiously, even more careful. Suffering just does that. But it doesn't end there. Look what it says next. It's a place where God's love comes through. But in love you have delivered me. I love that. But in love you delivered me. Learned in suffering that God loved him. He learned in suffering that God loved him. Hebrews 12, the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son he receives. My welfare in love, and then lastly here he says, I just want to rest on this verse, and it's just great. You have cast all my sins behind your back. Think about that passage. <laughs> behind your back. There is no one, no way, no how getting those sins back behind God's back. That's the point. It's behind his back. And he knew that he loved me. I, we know that God loves us when our sins are tossed behind his back. A place of unreachable and unseen. Never to be brought up again. Nobody goes behind God's back and brings our sins back. Your sins have been forgiven, family. Behind the back of God. We talk about that verse. I, um, I think it's in a song from the east is from the west. You know that verse? It's even a song. I like this one too. Where's my sins? Behind the back of God. Uh, Unbelievable. His sins no longer will be brought up. They're hurled behind him. Having received not death, the wages of sin, but a life, Hezekiah knew the evidence of God's favor and love, divine blessing. And then in verse 18 and 19, he talks about Sheol. If you look at those verses. Now, look at, look at verse 18, um, the word for. Remember, that connects verse 17. 
So what, Isaiah, what, 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 what uh, Hezekiah is saying in verse 18 when he says for Sheol, he's pointing back to from 17. Now, Sheol is the place of the dead in the Old Testament. We learn a lot more about it in the New Testament. But it's the place of the dead. Most of the time, it's the wicked people waiting for judgment. All right? But we learn a lot more in the New Testament about that. But what Hezekiah is saying is, if my sins were not forgiven, verse 17, and my life was not granted to me, then all the praise and the hope would be lost. But since we've been forgiven, and I've been forgiven, and given life, he says, I, could, I get to thank God. I have the opportunity and the ability, and I'm allowed not only to experience your faithfulness, dear Lord, but I will make it known to others. I'll make it known to others. All that you've done, I'll make it known to others. In other words, those who die cannot thank and praise God for delivering them from death. But now that Hezekiah's been delivered from death, he could preach the gospel, proclaim the good news. For it is the living who can praise the Lord and tell their children about his faithfulness and his promises. And then verse 20, save me. Play music on the stringed instruments. And pianos aren't the only thing to string, so are guitars. Some of you will get that. That's okay. At the house of the Lord. Hezekiah concludes this by saying, look, God's been faithful. I'm going to praise him after my lament. I'm praising, I'm affirming his belief that, that God was faithful. God kept his word. And now I'm going to the place of public worship in the house of the Lord. And I'm gathering God's people. And I'm going to sing of my redemption, of my deliverance. That's the mark of the redeemed. Then and today. They sing because they've been delivered. We sing because our hearts are free. We've been set free to worship God by the forgiveness of our sins. It is the heart, listen family, it is the heart that tastes, sees, and treasures what God has done in our salvation that responds in the praise and worship of God. That's the gospel. Isn't that why we sing the gospel, preach the gospel, pray the gospel, teach the gospel? As we get a greater understanding, as we see and we get a greater understanding of our need for deliverance, our desperate hopelessness trying to, 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 in our own strength and power, escape death. Greater understanding of our need to have our sins forgiven, to have God's wrath satisfied. And then we see the, great, the greater beauty, the greater glory, the greater wonder of God's love and forgiveness and deliverance freely given to us. It bursts into song and singing how great and awesome our God is. Notice what he says. He doesn't say I'm going to go sing in my car on the way home. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I said, I'm going to pray and sing in the community of God's people. I'm going to pray and sing in the community of God's people. Hezekiah is saying, I'm, you healed me. I'm letting people know. I'm going to, I'm going to sing of your deliverance. It's, 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 it's very selfless as he looks to God and wonder and praise. Unfortunately... This chapter 39. At that time, Merodach Baladin, the son of Baladin, king of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and presents to Hezekiah. For he heard that he had been sick and recovered. And Hezekiah welcomed them, the people from Babylon, gladly and showed them his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, precious oil, his whole armory, all that was found in his storehouse. There was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say to you? And from where did they come? And Hezekiah said, They came from a far country, from Babylon. He said, What have, you, what have they seen in the house, in your house? Hezekiah answered, They've seen all. All that's in my house. There's nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days, are coming that, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Verse 8. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought there will be peace and security in my days. Now remember, this is right before chapters, you know, the, you know, 39 is before 36 and 37, where Assyrian mocked God and Hezekiah, you know, sought the Lord. This is before that, 185,000 men killed. So my question, 
Why would Isaiah end this major section with a chronological event out of order? Why not end in chapter 37, 185,000 dead, Hezekiah faithful to the Lord, moving on. So he puts this story, even though it happened before that, after it. It's not by accident. It's not by accident. I think there are several reasons, but let me tell you what I think the main reason is. The main reason is that Isaiah wants to make it crystal clear that Judah and Hezekiah's trust is not to be placed in Hezekiah. In fact, not to be placed in any human leader, for they all are capable of failure. Israel's hope, Judah's hope, for righteousness and justice that Isaiah has been speaking about is found in someone greater than Hezekiah as we close chapter 39. He is not the promised king Isaiah spoke about in chapter 7 and chapter 9. He is not the one that Israel and Judah are waiting for. This chapter, this main section closes with the reader anticipating, longing for someone greater, someone better. That's why this is here. So real quickly, Judah gets a visit from a stronger and greater nation, Babylon. Hezekiah no doubt sees this mighty king from a foreign land coming to visit him as an ego boost. Self-importance can rob you of keeping your eyes on the purpose and glory of God because they keep them on yourself. Babylon is not a true friend of Israel, never has, never will be. In fact, the Bible talks about it in a metaphorical way as being an enemy of God throughout Scripture. Now, the king here is gushing over his newfound admiration, welcoming them gladly and joyfully, showing off all his treasures. Now, remember, a Syrian nation is still building. They're still growing in power. Hezekiah would love to have the nation of Babylon partner with him, I'm sure. Knowing that the Assyrian army has destroyed Israel already, and they're still on the prowl. So instead of concentrating on glorifying God for healing and sickness, for his healing and for, for the healing from his sickness, he's committed to spending his own glory, his earthly glory. Look at all the stuff I have. Hezekiah, listen, had an opportunity to do what he just said he was going to do earlier and to tell the world of the greatness and goodness of God. What an opportunity when the Babylonians come knocking on the door, hey, we heard you were sick, you're healed. Let me tell you about it. Let me tell you what the God of Israel, the Lord of hosts, the King of kings, the one who dwells in Jerusalem is done. Let, let, me, let me tell you about how he answered my prayer, how I sang a song about the experience, how his miraculous sign and his healing. If the focus was on God, it would have happened, but not here. Sometimes, family, when we live on mission and we're declaring and demonstrating the gospel, part of that has to do with our suffering, that we suffer well. It's no surprise. Really, you're a Christian you're suffering? Yeah. Look at Jesus. The one I love and worship was crucified. Isaiah finds out in verses 3 and 4. He's like, all right, who was there? What did they see? What did you tell them? What's all the hubbub? Talk to me. Hezekiah's like, oh, yeah, I gave him everything. Huh. And then verses 5 and 6, I, you know, I wasn't there, obviously. But I could only imagine Isaiah going, listening to him going, okay. All right. Uh, guess what? You know the treasures you just showed him? The Babylonian? Guess what? They're going there. <laughs> just, as, just as Hezekiah has shown the Babylonian envoy everything in his house, in his temple, everything that was in his house, all that will be taken and actually go to Babylon. Isaiah knows that no king is going to bring him in to his storehouses, give him the whole lay of the land. Here's the code to the, you know, to the nukes <laughs> without saying, hey, let's, let's partner together. He's doing everything, trusting again in foreign things, all the wrong places. He's acting like his dad. He's trying to live in a way of where he's the messianic promises that God has given him. You know what? We'll do it our way and through human effort, right? Therefore, not only the treasures, look what he says, but also his descendants. They'll be eunuchs. And you think, all right, well, Israel and the culture to have a descendant to have someone carry on the family line was very important. But not here. They're going to be eunuchs in the house. 
And for the record, Babylon does come in, does destroy Jerusalem in 586 B.C. And here we see Isaiah speaking of the truth of what's going to take place even after he dies. And some commentators are like, yeah, this must have been, in, you know, inserted a little bit later because how would Isaiah know that? I'm like, really? Because God told him. I don't know what's so hard about that. Like God knows it all from the beginning from end in one, one single second. So he told Isaiah what was going to happen. And that's pretty easy. And look what he says in verse 8 as we close. The word of the Lord is good. The word of the Lord is good. We say amen. The word of the Lord is good, right? He thought, man, okay, there's peace and security in my days. No prayer, no lamenting, no brokenness, no repentance. No, Lord, please don't do that. Please have mercy on me. Please have mercy on my descendants. No, he's like, oh, Isaiah, man, you, you were worrying me. I'm going to be okay. <laughs> All right, you had me concerned there for a minute. You're talking about, you know, being deported, having an exile, you know, with the nation. But as long as I'm okay, all is good. I don't really matter about them. The devastation, slaves, no, you know, un, uh, eunuchs, and I'm going to be dead in my bed, but peacefully. So all things are good. Family. Hezekiah is not the Messiah. The king they were ultimately waiting for, he is not the one. Chapter 38 and 39, he's positive and negative. One hand, he's, he's submitting and trusting. On the other hand, he's frail, broken, sinful, and mortal. Hezekiah, just enhammered by the goods and fames of this world, fails to trust God. And yet, when the devil comes to Jesus, our Savior, takes him to a high mountain, shows him all the kings of the world and the glory of those kingdoms, and says, all these are yours, if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus says, be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship your Lord, your God, and him only shall you serve. Pass the test. Hezekiah fails. Hezekiah seeks his own glory. Look at all these things that I have. And yet Jesus comes and seeks the glory of his father. John 17, I glorified you on earth. I've accomplished all the work you've given me to do. John 17, 4. Hezekiah, when hearing he was safe, even though his family would be devastated and defeated, brought into slavery, carried into exile, is happy that he didn't have to suffer, but can live a life of ease. Jesus, in the greatest act of selflessness, looks to the cross. It's brutality, it's shame, and it's cruelty. Ending with drinking the cup of wrath for sinners, says in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. Hezekiah's peaceful life and death brings many into slavery, yet Jesus' life of suffering brings many out of slavery. And that's the end of chapter 39. People are still not listening, and God still has grace upon them. God remains. God will restore. God will, and we'll see that in chapter 40 in a few weeks, that God is still God, and he will still show grace and mercy to his people. The band can come up, and let me just say one last thing. You look at this, and you say, look at Hezekiah's life. Look at, look at these ups and downs, and we say, well, it doesn't make sense. Well, you know what? It's not supposed to because you don't make sense. Nothing personal. Either do I. Right? But remember, Christ loves empty, ungrateful, wavering, confused sinners like you and me. And when the shepherd goes to the lost field, he lays the lamb who's run away on his shoulder and carries him home rejoicing. He awakens us through the gospel. He awakens us into repentance by his kindness, Roman tells us. The cross of Christ is gushing forth of ocean, the ocean of God's mercy for silly, foolish, wavering Sinners like you and me. <laughs> That's the gospel. That's the gospel. That's the good news of Christ. Huh? As we sing and we respond, let's stand together. As we sing and we, we respond, maybe you're at a place in your life, things are you're, you're wavering, maybe, maybe you are, are at a place where you need to just rest, trust in the midst of your suffering, keep looking up. And recognizing, you know what, I need the strength of God. I need, I need him to carry me. I need him to lead me. I need him to fill me with hope that I may see him walk through this and be faithful in it all. Maybe you're at that place today. So let, let, let's respond. Let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart that we can respond in a way that brings glory to him as the message of the gospel is preached this morning. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this message. Uh, uh, that we found in Isaiah, the, the, the narrative here in chapters uh, 38 and 39. And though, Lord, though we see many times our own selves in it, 
Uh, Lord, we pray that uh, we would end well, and Lord God, we would look to you, and in our silliness and in our foolishness and times like that, Lord, you would just forgive us of our sins, strengthen us, and encourage us, and Lord, in all that we go through, Lord, we pray, we do pray, Lord, that you would help us to be more like Jesus, that you are transforming sinners, Lord, into the glorious uh, truth of your Son, that we may resemble him in all of life. So, Lord, help us to worship, help us to respond as we sing together today, in Jesus' name, amen.